All right. Welcome back, everyone. And just for a reminder, we are recording this symposium today, and it will be able um, to be viewed on mda.org in a few weeks. So just remember that we are recording. Next, we have Kim Zahowski, who is a genetic counselor at UMass Memorial Medical Center, working in the adult neurology, cardiac, prenatal, and cancer specialties. She graduated from Stanford University School of Medicine's program in human genetics and genetic counseling in 2018. She spends much of her free time advocating for those with different genetic conditions and conducting research to help improve care for these patients. So Kim, I'll turn the presentation over to you and you can share your screen. One second. So hi all, thank you so much for having me. Can you all hear, can, just to make sure it can. It's, look, there you go. Okay, perfect. Um, so thanks for having me again. My name's Kim, I'm a genetic counselor at UMass. So I work with Dr. Wong a lot regarding patients with Duchenne muscular dystrophy since we work at the same center. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about the basics behind genetics and genetic testing for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Some of you may be familiar with genetics already, as I know a lot of you have a longstanding diagnosis of Duchenne's, but um, I think dis um, genetics is a notoriously tricky um, place to understand, so I want to give everyone a basic background. I have no conflicts of interest. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about what a genetic counselor is, um, the genetics behind Duchenne's, how in how Duchenne's is inherited, and genetic counseling for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, just a forewarning, I know a lot of you have excellent questions about gene therapies and exon skipping for Duchenne muscular dystrophy and Becker muscular dystrophy. That is not my specialty personally, so I'm not gonna be able to answer questions about that. Um, so I just wanted to give that forewarning. And most of my experience with patients with Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy has actually been in the prenatal setting when we have a parent who either is a carrier or affected with Duchenne talking about different reproductive options. So what's a genetic counselor? Again, some of you may have met with a genetic counselor before. Others of you, I might be the first person that you've ever encountered in genetic counseling. So basically, we are medical professionals who are specialized in, you guessed it, genetics and counseling. Um, so oftentimes we're talking to patients about different genetic conditions and how it will affect their families. We coordinate the testing to confirm a diagnosis um, or, you know, look at the different differentials on, you know, what could be affecting the patient if it's not Duchenne, for example. Um, and we talk to patients about, you know, who else in the family should get tested and things like that. Often we'll work with people called geneticists. Genetic counselors are masters trained specialists who specialize in talking about genetics and ordering testing. Geneticists are MD trained doctors who also have a specialty in genetics. So oftentimes when we're working with Duchenne muscular dystrophy patients or DMD patients, we'll be working together very closely. You might run into genetic counselors in a number of different specialties. For example, the most common you'll run into are prenatal cancer and pediatric. A lot of people with DMD um, talk to pre or pediatric genetic counselors and geneticists because oftentimes, again, it's diagnosed in childhood. Some of you might have di been diagnosed with a neurology genetic counselor, um, but there's certainly lots of different genetic counselors um, in different specialties. So I want to go into the basics behind genetics and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. As you know, all of you know at this point, you know, either you have the lived experience or you've been sitting through a number of talks on this. These are some of the signs and symptoms of DMD and BMD that we look for in clinic. Delayed walking after 18 months, um, walking on the toes with the legs apart or the belly pointed out, people who fall down a lot, um, delayed speech, fatigue, need um, something called the Gowers sign. So that's needing help getting up off the floor and using your arms to walk, your, um, walk up your body to a standing position. A lot of people with DMD have larger calves than other people their same age and size. And about a third of people who have DMD might have some learning disabilities like dyslexia, some have autism, because we know that dystrophin plays a role also um, in our neurons and how they communicate. So it is more common for people with DMD to have some of these learning disabilities. So in terms of thinking about diagnosis of DMD, oftentimes first a patient will come to attention because of some of those signs or symptoms like delayed walking or the Gower sign. And they'll meet with their PCP maybe or a neurologist. They do blood tests to look at enzyme levels. Many of you might be familiar with creatine kinase or the CK test. Basically, 
when there's a large amount of CK in the blood, it indicates that someone has muscle damage. So in those who have DMD, they have higher levels of CK that can bring them to attention to genetics. So often after they have that high CK level, they'll be sent to genetics to explore that high CK level. Having a high CK does not mean someone has DMD. There's a lot of different reasons why people have a high CK, because again, it really just means that there's muscle damage of some sort. So then the person meets with a genetic counselor or a geneticist. We go through their personal history and their family history and determine what genetic testing is most appropriate. Um, and presumably for those with DMD, we test the DMD gene um, to see if we find any mutations, deletions, duplications, nonsense or missense mutations that could be causing that person's signs or symptoms and diagnose them with DMD. Sometimes a muscle biopsy would be used. Um, so while sometimes we can determine a little bit about the prognosis from the genetic test, also muscle biopsies are helpful. Basically in the muscle biopsy, they're looking for presence of that protein that you're all familiar with, dystrophin. And so if there's any protein present that might help us understand if it's Becker's instead of Duchenne muscular dystrophy where there's typically no protein present. Also, genetic testing is not perfect. So while it is getting better and better in diagnosing people with Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy, it does miss some cases. So in some cases, they'll be doing the muscle biopsy to look at dystrophin even with a normal genetic test. And when I say genetics, some of you may be familiar with genetics, other people won't. So I wanna give you that background too. So basically our bodies are made up of lots and lots of cells. And in those cells, we have these things called chromosomes. Chromosomes are these big structures that hold all of our DNA. So they're basically like bookshelves for our DNA. And our DNA is comprised of genes. So basically chromosomes are the big structure. DNA is what the chromosomes are made up of. And if we chop it up, those are genes. And genes determine different traits about our body, what proteins are present, determine our eye color, our hair color. Um, and really when we're thinking about Duchenne's, of course, we're thinking about the DMD gene. Now the DMD gene or the dystrophin gene is the one that when it's not working, people have Duchenne or Becker's muscular dystrophy. It's comprised of 79 exons. So if we're thinking about a gene, exons are basically just smaller parts of that gene. Um, so there's 79 exons, it's a very large gene. And basically this gene is designed to create dystrophin, which is really important protein that's needed in muscle for muscle development. So you can imagine if this gene isn't working, just completely isn't working, um, this is more common with certain types of missense or truncating mutations. So mutations just that just make this gene not work altogether basically. Um, then someone doesn't have any dystrophin present and that would be uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. If this gene is altered in a way that it does create a protein, but it's a different protein or it's a smaller protein or it's just not the typical dystrophin protein, that's more typical of Becker muscular dystrophy. Um, so sometimes when looking at the genetics, you know, and look as a lot of you know, we can look to see which parts are deleted or duplicated or what mutations are present and we can get a better idea of what that prognosis would be for the person. It's not a perfect science, so we can't always tell, you know, this will be Duchenne or this will be Becker, but we can also look to see what other patients with those specific mutations, um, what kinds of signs and symptoms they have, for example, um, to get a better sense of the prognosis for a family. So again, this is an example of the mechanism. So in this case, the exon number 12 was deleted. Deletions are the most common type of mutation in the DMD gene, deletions. Um, so in this case, because it's deleted, see how those edges don't quite line up? That's why the dystrophin protein can no longer be created. Um, so because of that deletion, it disrupts that gene and how it works, no longer creating the protein, which is what causes the signs and symptoms of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So in terms of prognosis, again, it's not a perfect science. This is what the basis of exon skipping is, right? Because say you have you know, have a mutation in a gene, maybe they can skip that part of the gene to make it so those edges line up again to make um, the mutation in the gene less severe. Um, so kind of sometime, sometimes the, the goal is to transform Duchenne muscular dystrophy into Becker muscular dystrophy essentially um, through exon skipping. So they're still creating a protein instead of not creating a protein at all. And this is what you know, researchers are working on to be applicable to more and more types of exons as they were just discussing in the last, um, in the last presentation. So I think this is actually a very tricky part of understanding Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. Again, I work with a lot of 
um, people in a prenatal or preconception realm and trying to understand how Duchenne and Becker's is inherited, what the chances for a future pregnancy to be affected with Duchenne's and kind of what's going on in the family, who else needs testing. And this all goes back to chromosomes. So as I was saying, chromosomes are like the bookshelves for our DNA. Typically, people have 46 chromosomes total, or 23 pairs, half coming from their moms and half coming from their dads. So the first 22 are labeled, pairs are labeled by number. Those are the autosomes. But the ones we're focusing on are the sex chromosomes, because the DMD gene lies on the X chromosome. So typically, a female will have two X chromosomes, and typically a male will have an X and a Y chromosome. And this can also help you understand why it's really males who are affected and not females who are affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy, because essentially women have two copies of the DMD gene, one on each of their X chromosomes. So if one of those DMD genes isn't working or creating a less amount of dystrophin, they still have a backup copy on the other X chromosome. Whereas men, they only have one X chromosome. So they only have one copy of the DMD gene. So you can imagine if that DMD gene's not working, they don't have a second copy as backup. And that's why they're not creating any dystrophin, for example, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so this is really the crux of why men are more affected by this than women is because women have that backup copy, whereas men only have one copy of the DMD gene. So certainly I know in the chat, I saw lots of people who have DMD and they're in their 30s or their 40s or their 20s. Certainly many people who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy can go on and have children. It's you know very common that they'd be able to do this. So in thinking about someone who has Duchenne or Becker muscular dystrophy, what would the chance for any of their children to be affected? So basically, if we're going back to the sex chromosomes, when someone goes to have a child, they pass down one sex chromosome and their partner passes down the other sex chromosome. Um, so women will always be passing down an X chromosome, and what actually determines the biological sex of someone is if the man passes down an X or a Y chromosome. So if they pass down the X chromosome, it will be a female baby, and if it's a Y chromosome that the man passes down, it's a male baby. So if we think about this, say we have a man who's affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy. For any son that they have, they would be passing down the Y chromosome. That means they would not be passing down the DMD mutation. So none of their sons would be affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And it's not something that skips generations in that sense. So if um, you know, an affected person has a son, that son will not go back down to pass down the DMD mutation because they don't have that X chromosome. Um, so all of the daughters of an affected male would be a carrier for Duchenne muscular dystrophy because presumably they would have gotten that X chromosome from their father who's affected. So none of the sons from a father who's affected with Duchenne muscular dystrophy would have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And all of the daughters who um, are a, a father who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy would be a carrier for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. That's different, of course, if a mother's a carrier because the inheritance is a bit different. So if a mother's a carrier, that means they have one of the DMD genes not working and the other DMG gene is working and they're gonna pass down one of those X chromosomes to each of their kids. So half of their sons would be affected and half of their daughters would be a carrier and half of their sons would be not affected and half of their daughters would not be a carrier. This doesn't, this is totally random. So it's a flip of a coin for each child, just like it's a flip of a coin, whether someone will have a male or a female baby. It's a flip of a coin, whether they pass down that working DMD gene or the non-working DMD gene. It's not like you have two sons, one will be affected, one won't be affected. It's totally random, both random, both could be affected, neither could be affected. Um, but this is the general sense of inheritance. So certainly if we know someone has DMD or if they, um, are a carrier of DMD, there are different reproductive options, which we talk about with a patient. Um, and just to better understand what the chances are and what resources and get that, those patients the appropriate resources for that baby or for whatever situation they'd like. So in about two thirds of cases, um, someone who has a child with DMD, the mom is a carrier. So in about two thirds of the cases, if we do genetic testing on a child and we find that they have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we do the testing on the mom, the mom will also be a carrier. The large majority of women who are carriers don't have any muscle weakness, but maybe up to 10% might have some signs of muscle weakness or fatigue, generally not nearly the same 
as a male who has the condition, but some might need to see a neurologist or see a physical therapist. I know that at UMass, um, Dr. Wong has a clinic for carrier females, for example, so some might need some extra follow-up there. But there is an increased chance for heart problems. So basically, with the DMD gene, it's responsible, again, for dystrophin, which helps our muscles develop. The heart is a big muscle. So there's been some estimates that maybe about 10% of women who um, are carriers for Duchenne muscular dystrophy will have cardiomyopathy or different types of heart problems. So cardiomyopathy is basically a difference in the structure of the heart. One that's fairly common would be something called dilated cardiomyopathy, which is when the heart is a little more flimsy, I'd say, than someone else's heart. So basically what we recommend for all female carriers is that they get cardiac evaluation either in their late adolescence or early adulthood. And even if it's normal, follow up every three to five years for just um, heart monitoring, which might consist of something called an EKG, which is monitoring the rhythm of the heart, or an echocardiogram, which is looking at the structure of the heart. That means in the other third, one third of cases, the patient's mother is not found to be a carrier. So in a child who has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we test mom, mom's not found to be a carrier. Generally then, it's thought to be a new thing in that child and is less likely to run in a family, except there's something called germline mosaicism. When we think of mosaic, we can think of like the pictures of mosaics that are made up of different colors. Um, and so germline mosaicism is the same idea. Sometimes people have different genetic material in their egg cells, for example, or in their sperm cells than they do in their blood cells. And we can't eliminate the chance that a female um, who has a child with Duchenne muscular dystrophy could have different genetic material in her blood than she does in her eggs. And this actually happens in about 15 to 20% of those cases. So even in a mother who tests negative for the DMD variant, there's still a chance to have another child with, the, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, so we can still consider testing siblings, for example, there's still prenatal options, for example, just because there still is an increased chance. And so what's genetic counseling look like for Duchenne muscular dystrophy? So really the goal in genetic counseling or seeing a medical geneticist is to help understand the genetic cause behind Duchenne's. Oftentimes we'll go basically talk about what I just talked about with a patient. A lot of times we might be the people who diagnose someone with Duchenne muscular dystrophy or on the very front end of the diagnosis. So these are families who maybe didn't know anything about Duchenne muscular dystrophy and are just being diagnosed. So we might be the first people they encounter. So we give them, we give patients a background understanding of Duchenne muscular dystrophy and how it's inherited and what it means for families, um, what it means for that person's care. We help make the referrals to the appropriate providers for treatment because it's not geneticists or genetic counselors who are doing the treatment, but we do make those referrals and help families understand who they need to see, um, you know, like neurology, pulmonology, cardiology, things like that. We talk to the families about, um, who else in the family might need testing? You know, if a mom's a carrier, then maybe her siblings or her parents would need testing. So a lot of times, again, genetic information is family information. So we're talking about, you know, it's kind of a domino effect of when one person's diagnosed, we might diagnose a bunch of other people with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, and we also might talk to people about family planning, um, what it means for future family members, um, whether they want to just get the resources in place for a new baby, or want to discuss prenatal options, really, we talk about all of that. We navigate genetic testing and help families understand what the results mean. So a lot of times when someone's coming into a genetics clinic, it doesn't mean that they have a diagnosis, they're being worked up. So a lot of times they might actually need more testing than just for the DMD gene. We wanna evaluate other reasons why someone might have muscle weakness and elevated CK level. So we might not just be testing for the DMD gene, we might be looking at a bunch of other genes too, depending on inheritance, what patterns we see in a family, who else is affected, things like that. Um, and finally, we help refer to the appropriate um, community resources. You know, it's so important that people have a network of other people that they know who have the same condition and we'll help them find those resources. We might refer them to the MDA website. We might help them find local support resources or Facebook groups, things like that, so people can get connected with the community that they just joined. And this is a lot of talk about what genetic testing is. And some people ask, oh, what is, is it a biopsy? What is it? It's a blood or saliva test. 
So when we do genetic testing, often it's a blood test that we do. Um, we get a tube of blood, we ship it off to a lab that does the analysis. They look for the type of mutations that are present. They look at the spelling of the DNA basically to see if there's a big piece missing, a big piece deleted, a, a spelling difference, and then we get the report. And then we get the report and we interpret the report and we share it with the family members in a follow-up visit. So basically, pre-test counseling for DMD, we go through that personal and family history, get a better idea of what our differential is. Sometimes we already know DMD is in a family, and so that's a little more straightforward. Sometimes we're trying to figure out why this person has muscle weakness. Um, we go over genetics and testing options and do informed consent, um, which actually is a fairly extensive process. Usually appointments are about an hour. Um, then we might do a genetic test, um, again, blood or saliva. And then we do post-test counseling. So a lot of times we'll meet with these families again. We'll discuss the different treatment guidelines. We'll discuss their new diagnosis. We'll discuss family members who need to consider testing and again, those resources. So, you know, some of you might be watching this and say, I wanna meet with a genetic counselor. I think that's important for my family. Ask your doctor for a referral. Certainly if you're linked in with a neurologist um, who, you know, regarding DMD, they should be able to connect you with a genetic counselor or a geneticist. Um, there's also this website called nsgc.org slash find a, you know, find a genetic counselor and you can find a genetic counselor near you if your doctor doesn't know where to find one. And some of you might be wondering about costs associated with genetic testing. Now, genetic testing is notoriously expensive. Um, it is getting a lot cheaper as technologies are advancing. So um, I know of testing programs that if someone was to pay out of pocket, it would be $250, for example. Um, most insurance will approve of testing but how much it costs depends on people's copay or deductible. So if we're suspicious of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or if someone has a family history of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, almost all insurance companies will approve of testing to do it. That doesn't mean it's free. Um, with our healthcare system, you know, even if it's approved, it doesn't mean it's covered. There could be a copay or deductible. Let's say we have someone who doesn't have health insurance or financial is a big consideration. Certainly finances are a consideration for anyone. There are free testing programs for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So um, one pretty well-known free testing program for Duchenne is something called De Decode Duchenne, which is a free testing program for those who are suspected of having Duchenne muscular dystrophy. There's also another program through a lab called Invite Laboratories, and they have one called Detect Muscular Dystrophy. It's a free program for those suspected of having a muscular dystrophy. So they actually look at more than just the Duchenne gene, but certainly the Duchenne genes on there. Um, and this specific lab will actually do free testing for family members in, if we find an affected person. So say someone were diagnosed through that test, you'd have 90 days to get free testing for a family member. Um, so that's you know, another accessible way to make things more accessible, if, especially with finances. Um, these are not tests that anyone can order themselves. So this would be still something that you'd have to talk to a specialized neurologist or a genetic counselor about, but there are free testing programs out there for this. Um, so we wanna make genetic testing more and more accessible so we can diagnose the right people and get them the appropriate screening. So that's it for my presentation. Um, and I think we have some time for questions. Thank you, Kim. Yes, we do have time and we've got a few in. Um, if testing, if testings are, are improved, would it be beneficial um, to have it redone? This person was tested 14 years ago and it says, um, and her second, second spin off of that is, do DMD patients have polymorphism? So, so basically with testing, if someone was diagnosed with Duchenne 14 years ago, that test will likely prove the same thing. So it's, the testing has improved in that we can determine more people who have Duchenne, but if we already found that the person has Duchenne muscular dystrophy, then that test result wouldn't change because we already found the cause. But let's say we have someone who's suspected to have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, um, then, then um, and they didn't have a genetic test result, then genetic updated genetic testing might be appropriate to try to figure out if we can now find the cause. Um, so yes, genetic testing has improved, but certainly if it was found in the past, we wouldn't necessarily need to revisit it. Polymorphism just means that there are different variations basically. And so there are definitely different variations that cause Duchenne's and you know, everyone has different variations in their DNA. Okay. Is partial deletion of exon seven and eight more on the Becker side? I wouldn't know that off the top of my head. So basically, you know, we'd have to 
when we have a patient who has a specific deletion or which was it partial deletion of seven and eight, mm -hmm. it kind of depends. So when we think about the genetics to make it very, very simple, we can kind of look at these like puzzle pieces. So in this example, say it was just deletion of exon five, four and six still kind of fit together. So you can still create the protein. It might just not be the same protein. Let's say we deleted exon seven. Um, then those simplicity's sake, those say they don't match anymore. And that could cause basically the, the gene to stop reading starting exon six, because it doesn't um, match anymore, if that makes sense. Okay. So when we're trying to interpret the genetic testing results, that's a longer process with both um, the geneticist and also neurologist to figure out how it affects that protein, which is also sometimes where the muscle biopsies play a role, because sometimes we can't figure it out with genetics. It's not a perfect science. When the mm -hmm. muscle biopsy plays a role is if we found someone has a mutation in the DMD gene, we can look at the muscle biopsy, do staining for dystrophin to see if dystrophin's present. And if dystrophin's present, that makes us think more Becker's. If there's no dystrophin present, that makes us think more Duchenne. Okay, thank you. Um, this person's typing in, I've never been tested as a carrier because I have three sons, but only my youngest has Duchenne, he's 18 and there's no history of Duchenne in my family. Can you confirm that in this scenario, I would not be a carrier without testing? So after, that's a great question. So even if you, so this person has three sons, one's affected, it doesn't mm -hmm. run in the family. Mm -hmm. It's still possible that this person could be a carrier. Um, so it could have been new in her, for example, it might not be running in the family and she might have it. And then she might just have had one child who had it. She mm -hmm. could very well not be a carrier too. So actually in this case, I would say genetic test, it would be appropriate to at least discuss genetic testing because she could still, she could still be a carrier, even if it doesn't appear in the family. It could also just be by chance that it is running in the family. So say mom had it, say grandma had it, but there are lots of sisters and just no one knows. Mm -hmm. um, but I would say in that case, the person could still be a carrier um, or, and may, may very well not be too. Okay. How many gene splicing cases like the Exxon 3 case are known? I'm, I'm not quite sure what this patient's referring to quite okay. honestly. Okay, that's okay. Um, uh, I guess I'll just tell that person if you have a more specific question to please type that in the Q&A. Um, and then this person's asking, why is a second blood test necessary for genetic testing? Um, after the CK level? Um, so genetic testing is one blood test, but it is a separate test than something like the CK level, which is what I assume this patient's talking or person's talking about. Mm -hmm. So the CK level is looking at enzymes, whereas genetic testing, you have to basically send to a different lab. They need a new blood sample. So they can't just go back to that old blood sample. They need a new blood sample, but usually it is just one blood sample that they need for the genetic test, unless it fails for whatever reason, but that's not that common. Okay. Um, and our last question, um, I understand dystrophin gene 40 area is BM BMD. Um, a geneticist had said possibly lighter. Is that under, is that your understanding of that? Possibly lighter? Yes. Um, I would have to look more into that specific exon. Okay. I would trust whatever geneticist you've met with who probably did a lot more research on it, but off the top of my head, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. And then our last question, this person's son has a nonsense mutation of exon 64 and was diagnosed with Duchenne without a muscle biopsy. How do we know that he does in fact have Duchenne as opposed to Becker? Yeah, that's a good question. So not everyone needs a muscle biopsy for a diagnosis. It depends on the signs and sometimes they can make the diagnosis based mm -hmm. on the signs and symptoms already present in that person. Nonsense mutations are ones that notoriously cause Duchenne's and not Becker's. Um, Backers, a lot of times will be an in-frame deletion would be something like just deletion of exon 27, 26, and 28 still line up. So you can, which is kind of um, simplifying it a bit, but basically certain types of mutations are much more likely to be Duchenne's and certain types are more likely to be Becker's. Um, so sometimes they don't need to do a muscle biopsy, actually. The, I, muscle biopsies are getting more and more uncommon. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was very informative. Yeah, um, thanks appreciate for having your time me. on Saturday. Of course. So, well, thanks thank so you. much for having me, everyone. It's been a pleasure to talk. Thank you.
All right, we're gonna take a quick break and at uh, a quarter after, we will hear about pulmonary care and nutrition surrounding DMD. So we will be right back. 